New Mexico, of all the border states, has the smallest uh, border, but I think the issues are very similar. And, uh, you know, kind of from a bottom line standpoint, uh, we're getting the cream of the crop when it comes to workers uh, from Mexico. Uh, I think uh, legal immigration is a good thing. Uh, these are about individuals that are coming across the border, uh, really making a contribution uh, from a work standpoint. And, uh, you know, paying uh, paying taxes, uh, Social Security, um, Medicaid, uh, Medicare, um, contributing to the system. Again, this would be legal immigrants coming into work. What about illegal immigrants and at the rate at which they've been arriving in Arizona in recent decades? Well, illegal immigration certainly is an issue. Um, as governor of New Mexico, and I was governor of New Mexico from 1995 through 2002, uh, I tried desperately to uh, ascertain uh, cost benefit. In other words, how much was being paid out uh, for uh, illegal immigration as opposed to uh, legal immigration and what that was bringing in. And from a cost benefit standpoint, I think the benefits far outweighed what was going out. Now, that doesn't excuse illegal immigration. Do you think that's true in Arizona's case, too, by the way, as a matter of financial economic cost-benefit analysis? You know, I'm not. I, of course, I'm, I'm just speaking of New Mexico, not Arizona. And uh, the fact that I, I would not have signed the bill uh, in, in Arizona. Now, that isn't to say that I don't understand the pressures that uh, Governor Brewer was under to uh, sign that legislation and the frustration that uh, Arizona feels uh, but I, I would probably have a different tact on how to uh, approach the situation. I think the fact that the federal government hasn't enforced these laws, is ju it just speaks to the fact that they're kind of uh, unenforceable. And now seeing Arizona basically attempting to do the same, I think the outcome is going to end up to be the same. But it'll be interesting to see uh, just how this does play out. I, I just I think it is going to lead to racial profiling. And, and and certainly not uh, in a majority of those uh, in the majority of cases, but all it takes is a small percentage uh, to add up to some serious egregiousness. I think when it comes to uh, uh, detaining and requiring individuals to show identification. Gary Johnson, former New Mexico governor, my guest on WNYC thinking about running for the 2012 Republican presidential nomination. And one of the motivators uh, for the Arizona law is the spike in drug gang violence on the other side of the border and its implications for this side of the border that's mostly marijuana trafficking-related violence. And you're in the headlines for your response to this, that it's a function of prohibition. Care to elaborate? Well, I, I just think that uh, uh, Mexico in general, has the Mexican border has been vilified because of the drug trade. And um, I, for 11 years now, have espoused uh, the legalization of marijuana. And when I say legalize pot, look, never legal to smoke pot, become impaired, get behind the wheel of a car, never legal to smoke pot, become impaired, do harm to others. Uh, same, same as alcohol. Um, we're arresting 1.8 million people a year in this country, half of what we spend on law enforcement, half of what we spend on the courts, and half of what we spend on the prisons is drug-related. And to what end? Again, we're arresting 1.8 million people. I just happen to think that 90 percent of the drug problem is prohibition-related, uh, not use-related, and that's not to discount the problems with use abuse. And now, with the border violence, uh, really, I think that this is... Uh, these are drug cartels. This is this is prohibition speaking. These are disputes being played out with guns rather than the courts. And recently I saw a, st a statistic that 70 percent of drug cartels in Mexico are dealing with marijuana. And, and again, I'm talking about now about the marijuana trade uh, across the border. And I think this is uh, really contributing to the uh, boogeyman status, if you will, of, of immigration uh, across the border, illegal immigration across the border. So how far would you go to legalize marijuana in this country? Just let it be a completely um, sold, you know, openly taxed, maybe quality controlled, uh, like liquor or well, anything yeah, else? Yeah, like liquor. Control it. Regulate it. Uh, tax it. Um, uh, like what, a, what about other drugs? Well, I, I think that we should adopt harm reduction strategies regarding other drugs. And, and, and at the basis of harm reduction is just looking at the problem first 
as a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. When you look at Holland, when you look at Portugal, which has recently uh, really reformed uh, its drug laws, they have very low use rates. They have 60 percent the drug use as that of the United States. That's kids, that's adults, that's marijuana, that's hard drugs. Of course, that's on a per capita basis. But it would suggest that by, that having rational drug policy, which again in Holland's case is effective decriminalization of all drugs, that it would that it would be again I just suggest much more rational and actually have impact that we would desire. But does that mean legalize, regulate, and tax cocaine like you just described? No, I'm, from I'm, no, no, That's I, something I'm, else. I'm not advocating right. The, I'm not advocating the legalization of any other drug other say, than marijuana. But you said decriminalize. So how is that different from what we do now? Well, uh, not not even drugs. not even decriminalize the harder drugs. Oh, just just look at the harder drugs from the from the from a harm reduction st- right. standpoint. Harm reduction being reducing death, disease, crime, corruption. Looking at the problem first as a health problem rather than a criminal justice problem. Um, so you're for legalization of marijuana. So much for getting elected president of the United States, or do you think that's not the case? Well, now, I, I know that you're commenting on my running for president of the United States. I, I am a, a chairman of a 501c4, and as part of the 501c4, um, I'm not running for any office of any kind. That's part of the 501c4. So. Uh, you, I, I realize your name uh, was in the well, you tell me how interested are you in in flirting with this idea? Your name was in the Southern Republican Leadership Conference straw poll. Yeah, no, no. Uh, that uh, again, that my name would have been submitted. I wouldn't have submitted my name to that straw poll. But uh, and again, this is being floated about. Uh, but as part of a five hundred one c four, I'm I don't want to get sideways with my legal status. I see. So you can't say anything like that, but others can say you got it things right, right. around that. And some people along those lines are calling you. The new Ron Paul. That might be unfair to his son, Rand Paul, who's running for Senate in Tennessee. It might be very unfair to Ron Paul. Uh, And he shares many of his father's views. But do you like that label with respect to yourself? Well, I'm a Ron Paul fan. I uh, endorsed Ron Paul during the last cycle. And uh, I I think that, um, uh, you know what, I I just, uh, from a principled standpoint, uh, talking about the Constitution, that uh, there is a blueprint for returning this country, uh, uh, getting this country back on track, and that would just simply be to follow the United States Constitution. I think uh, Ron Paul brought that really to the forefront. You're also called a Tea Party politician. Is that an insult for you or a badge of honor? You know, I was at a Tea Party event in uh, South Carolina, and there was a handout. Uh, Here are the 10 things that a Tea Partier most stands for. And really... uh, a, B, C, D, E, F, G, those 10 things were about fiscal matters. And that's really what I do care about, dollars and cents, common sense, uh, the fact that we're bankrupt, the fact that we're spending 43 cents out of – the fact that 43 cents out of every dollar that we're currently spending is uh, borrowed, uh, the notion that we're bankrupt. And bankruptcy manifests itself in the fact that the federal government is printing money to cover the obligations, and as a result of that, um, uh, decreased value in the dollar uh, and inflation uh, definitely on the horizon. Not not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Obligations, promises, political promises that were made that should never have been made. They were Ponzi schemes. We watched them being made. And so for me... uh, it's it's all it's all about uh, dollars and and common sense. 